the special topics of American history we did the Vietnam War and the Thank You Rights protest, or the uh, anti war protests. And my picture for the whole time pictures from the Jetsons. So this one, for the last one of the unit, the Jetsons meet the Flintstones. You know that was a good episode. Yeah. Anyone ever seen the Jetsons? Yeah. If you've ever seen the Jetsons, that was supposed to take place in the crazy, wacky year of 2022. Virtually every prediction of the future is wrong. <laughs> you find out. The Flintstones, that was 1981. So, review book. You do not have to bring it. Down the road, I might occasionally ask for you to, to do like some review questions at the end of each chapter. Each chapter, they have multiple choice review questions. They also have other questions like they do on the AP and Senate. And it's really good to do this on your own. So this is mostly for you. But we get close to the test, I will assign a few things. And I might do another one like we did too, if I'm gone and I need something. Or parts we might not get as much coverage and I wanna make sure we have at least a basics before the test. It's gonna happen. I might use the review book. And at the end of the, the review book, there's a whole entire practice test. Now, it doesn't have a key, but on my webpage, I will put it on the front page of my webpage, but also in the AP US History section, under test review, there is a PDF of the key for the entire book. So that's the key. So I want you to be able to use it and go back, if you do practice test or go back, do multiple choice. And then think about the multiple choice questions. They're hard multiple choice questions. And they're, for the most part, they're standalone questions, but they give you a stimulus, a little paragraph, a diagram, a political cartoon, something to stimulate a memory of that era, of that theme, of that, uh, uh, of that idea that the question will be about. And so I do multiple choice questions. I throw multiple choice questions at you. The stimulus, then therefore we actually take the test should help you prepare. You've already some of you already know what I'm talking about. And that's why I asked you to do those, do those ones at the end of the chapter. So any questions on that? Everyone happy about this? Who did the questions at the back of the chapter six? I asked you to do those and left a key. Did okay on them. I thought there's a few that are weirdly written. Let's be clear about something with the AP exam. In fact, all standardized tests, because almost all of you are taking the PSAT, aren't you? I think it's just going to be a <laughs> Bring your textbook tomorrow and good shoes. We do a couple hikes. I'm going to drop you off the mountain. But you can bring your book with you <laughs> to survive the students. And you guys are taking the PSAT. You've done standardized tests before. You have to get used to the way they write questions. You have to get used to it. I'll give you more practice tests. You can find practice tests online of varying degrees of uh, quality. I will give you links to practice tests. So we'll do more. But for standardized tests and then the AP exam, you have to understand that the people who write these test questions, they don't let them out in public. These are people they keep in basements, isolated. They don't talk to human beings. So they never talk to actual living people. And so when you read the questions, you have to understand this is written by somebody who doesn't know how to communicate to people. You've done standardized tests. Would you agree with that assessment? So you just have to get used to the way they write. Yeah, kind of drives me nuts too. But you get patterns, you get you know, used to it. I know my question, you know, what the heck was he saying? But I routinely, occasionally talk to people. Is it routinely, occasionally a contradiction? Like in tall short guy. Okay, so chapter seven of America, a regular textbook that is due on, that I told you this, didn't I? On Friday. Bring your regular textbook tomorrow. And um, I already gave you the postmark for that. I do have extra copies and I put, I will always make sure somewhere on team that I have copies of that. So it's on there. Don't forget 11th of November, it's the last day to take the, the AP exams on teams. I have a copy of that. If you're one of those um, degenerates who did not sign up for the College Board website yet, you know who you are. 
I have that form, a copy on there too, if you can't remember the number. Sound good? All right, so let's go ahead. I gotta go fast through the stuff on the federal there, so let's do it. And we got through the Constitution ratified. Who are the people for the Constitution? What were they called? Federalists, who are the people against? The clever name of anti federalists. And the big issue was strong central government. But for the anti federalists, they also feared there was no, no what that um, Jefferson really wanted. No what? No Bill of Rights. And also, states were worried about losing power, especially control over what thing? States wanted control over what? Yeah, it's militia. Did you say militia? Yes, militia. Especially southern states because of fear of what? Now, let's be clear about it. That isn't the reason they wanted strong protection for state militia. Was, it wasn't the reason to protect slavery. But the southern states were obsessed with it. So when they talk about state militia, it was about slavery. Slavery would not survive. So the point is, lots of gray area. Just like I've heard people tell, I've had people tell me that the Electoral College was created to protect slavery. No, it was not. But it did help protect slavery. Do you get the difference in that? Okay, so let's get to the federal, it did ratify. Let's get to the Federalist era. And this is going to be the first 11, 12 years of the country, and it about didn't make it. It was close. So many different times this could have fallen apart. It was always a close run deal, and it's going to be all the way up until the Civil War. The country, the United States, and what it means to be an American citizen would be created after the Civil War. It's still kind of thorny here, and we don't have capitalism yet. It's, it's just a different world. So these are some of the, the leading people we know about, Hamilton, Adams, and this is kind of would become one side of the divide, and they're urban, more oriented towards merchant class, Jefferson, Madison, rural, plantation, slave owners, different ideology, different, they're elites, they're the definition of elites, but they have different points of view. The Constitution was meant to protect the elite, but elites aren't always the same. Yeah. No, he was, a, he was actually going to be the first Speaker of the House. Yeah, the first cabinet. He's going to be the vice president. Knox will be secretary of war. Edmund Randolph, attorney general. State, treasury. And those are the two we care about. Sorry, the other ones. I mean, yeah, they, um, they, created a, they would create a war department, but there was no army. There's still militia. And then event, they would create a navy at the end of the decade, and they created a navy department. The Defense Department, which you've all heard of, would not be created until 1947. Got a few years. Where they would combine. They thought it would make it easier. It made it even more complex. But everybody's vying for the Washington. Washington is in both camps in reality. In both camps. But he greatly admired and respected Hamilton. He also didn't trust Hamilton. But it would be a smart thing to not trust Alexander Hamilton. Especially if he was alive today, because it'd be very shocking. So, Madison would write the Bill of Rights. He would write 12 amendments, 10 would be ratified. And you'd see all these little things of Bill of Rights. You'd see little charts. If you go on the internet, you'd see little things about the Bill of Rights. People mention it. Like the, the First Amendment, the freedom of speech, the freedom of religion, press assembly and petition. The second, the right to bear arms. The third, quartering of soldiers, and so on. No legal search and seizure. Due process for people accused of a crime. Right to trial. Trial for the jury. Just um, limitations on bail and punishment. People and states have rights. These basic things, you've seen these, right? It doesn't tell the whole story. And it's one of the things that people don't understand what's really going on with the Bill of Rights. Madison wrote these partially to appease Jefferson, but he wanted to make sure that the states were subservient to the federal government. So let's get to the First Amendment very quickly. And you've probably seen this. Here's one 
Lisa McCarthy from years ago, celebrating the First Amendment, the freedom of speech press. And you've heard people say, I have a freedom of speech. Respect my free speech. These are anti-war protesters to the Vietnam War in 1965. I have freedom of speech. And you've probably all heard that. So you might even have said it. I have freedom of speech. Do you have freedom of speech? No way in the Constitution does it say you have freedom of speech. My point is here, we're not going to go through each amendment. We're going to cover little things, but I want to show you how things are more complex. Oh, one more thing before we get to that. Every single amendment, especially 11 of the 12 that he wrote, all had some kind of historical precedent that led to it. Something happened in Britain or what Britain did to the colonies that led to this. This was not Madison sitting in an ivory tower pondering life and they came up with this would be the perfect system for all society. No, he's writing something that will pass a convoluted political system. Remember, it's really hard to pass an amendment. Two thirds of Congress, three quarters of the states. It's hard. He also wanted to write it in such a way that didn't give the states too much power. He's going to write a lot of times gobbledygook, which is a great way of saying mumble jumble. <laughs> He's being ambiguous. But gobbledygook is really fun to say. Try it. Say it. Oh, come on. Say it. Gobbledygook. Oh, that no enthusiasm at all. Say it like you're meeting. No. Let's look at the First Amendment. He didn't say you have freedom of speech. He didn't say that at all. First off, this is law. Laws are written to be confusing. Partially, two reasons. First off, lawyers want it for job security. But secondly, there's blue parts. And that's my purpose. That's not necessarily good, that's not necessarily bad, but you need to know there's loopholes in every law. What does it say? Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of a religion or free exercise thereof. It doesn't say you have freedom of religion. It just says that Congress can't pass a law saying you can't practice a certain religion. Congress cannot pass a law saying there will be no druids in the United States. It doesn't pass that law or any other religion. There'll be no Protestants, no Catholics, no Christians, no Jews, whatever. It can't pass that, but it doesn't say anything is a religion. You can't just say, well, okay, I'm going to have the religion of stealing money from freshmen. I'm going to go to the hall, hit them with a hammer and steal their money. And that's my church. And how dare you take away my right of freedom of religion? No, you do not have that right. It doesn't define what a religion is. It just says they can't take away your religion. So it could say. Yeah, I'm not going to take away your religion, but what you say is a religion. No, it's not. It's not religion. You do not have a blanket freedom. It doesn't say you can do. It says Congress can pass the law. And remember, Congress passes the law. Who enforces the law? Next, Congress shall make no law. I know it's weird. Abridging the freedom of speech. It doesn't say you have freedom of speech. It says that Congress can't take away that right. So Congress can't pass a law saying everybody with blue eyes cannot speak. They will be immediately arrested. Now you notice my eyes are more green, so I'm fine. And by the way, who decides what blue is? The executive branch. No, it can't pass a law denying certain people the right to speech. But you can't say whatever you want. It doesn't define what free speech is. So, for example, you can't decide to walk into a crowded theater and scream fire to watch the panic. Fun as that might be, you can't do that. Therefore, you do not have a bunch of freedom of speech. Or, for example, you can't walk into somebody's store or their restaurant and start screaming obscenities. And not say approve of that. But if they don't, they can kick you out. And you can't say, well, I have freedom of speech. No, you don't. Nowhere does it say that someone can't have a restriction of speech in their establishment. Or for that matter, the same deal about people write whatever they want on social media, on Twitter, or whatever people are. 
if you're old, you're um, people on Facebook. If you're young, what is it? Tic Tac, Tic Tac, so you know. I purposely know nothing about it. I'm one of the few people, old people who are, has nothing to do with Facebook. Not it, there's nothing about it. I'm a rarity. Because I'm cool. No, that's Okay, so, but do you get the point there? They can ban you. You don't have a blanket freedom of speech. If it was all oh, freedom of speech, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that I know that we have certain expectations that we can say certain things, but you notice the gray area. They get my point here. Does everyone get what I'm trying to get at? Same thing here. Make no law abridging the freedom of the press. But they can still censor the press if they decide that's not or that that could be it's no longer um, spreading the free information. It is perhaps inciting a rebellion. And so in the 1830s, they're going to ban any pamphlets or anything like that about abolitionists, anti-slavery, because it might incite a slave rebellion. So you can't do it. Not going to do it. And that we could argue, no, that totally violates any extent of the Constitution. Sure, but there is gray areas. Loopholes. Or peaceably assemble. Same deal. You can peaceably assemble, but what's peaceably mean? What's the difference between a peaceful protest, a peaceful uh, coming together of people to, uh, for a point of view, and a mob bent on violence? Do you see the loophole? Or petition the government to redress grievances? I'm oh, sure you petition the government. Do they have to read it? Thank you for a position. I really care about what you think. I'm going to file it away. There are gray areas in every single amendment or every law. There are no blanket rights. And one more thing. Does anywhere does it say the people have rights? The Bill of Rights, get this down, are restrictions on the government curtailing rights not giving the people rights. And that's a big difference. Government curtailing rights, not rights for the people. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not making any value judgment for this, because do you really want a blanket freedom of speech? Could that be problems with blanket freedom of religion? So we could argue good or bad, my point is, it's much more complex than saying any of it for any rights. The Second Amendment, that's another classic example. We know what they're talking about then. We know how people started interpreting it after the 1970s. It's really complex. Let's get to that, the Second Amendment. Now, Madison did not want state control militias. So Madison wrote this amendment, and it starts with a clause. Laws don't start like this. And so already it's messed up. I mean, this is just, it, it's a word salad. On purpose. Madison did this on purpose. So it would be very ambiguous. And boy, is it ambiguous. So I put two cartoons down. Here is one implying that the Second Amendment, it's all about personal weapons, people believe. And that's not at all what it was about. But here, personal weapon was a, rifle, a musket from 18 or 1776 and modern weapons. And so it doesn't make sense to have Second Amendment rights. Or here, the Second Amendment is protecting the people from tyranny. And people talk about this with personal weapons. In cartoons, people talk about that beginning in the 1970s. Didn't happen before. That's not what they talked about here. The entire debate, all of it, was about militias. And about states. Nobody in Congress at all, not only did they talk about, did, did they not talk about personal ownership of weapons, they didn't talk, um, they wouldn't even have thought of it. It would have made no sense. They crossed their mind. This is not about personal ownership of weapons. It's all about militia. 
for a state militia? Will you be required to join the militia? Will there be a standing army? Will there not be a standing army? That was the whole thing. So we get this mumbo jumbo. What's regulated? Regulated means well and organized. The Constitution says Congress will arm and equip the militia. And that's what they were feared. Congress armed and equipped. That means they control them. So this said they'll be regulated. So it's not going to be a bunch of yay moves running around claiming they're in a militia. It's got to be regular. It doesn't define that. That would not be defined until Congress would define it in 1877. Do we all know what the well-organized militia is in the United States? Every state has one. National Guard created in 1877. So be necessary to the security of a free state, which also that's unclear. State has two definitions. State, most people when they refer to the state, that meant your country, that country, the United States, France, whatever. But also doesn't mean states. Remember, state control the militia. That's about as ambiguous as you can get. What does that even mean? And it's written in such a way, I don't know. It's really confusing and isn't it? Let's get to the next thing. The right of the people. Who are the people? The preamble of the Constitution starts with we the people. It does not mean individuals. It means we the people or the citizens of the United States. Not individuals, it's us. Does it mean that? Well, since they were talking about militia, probably. But you can see how people would find, well, wait a minute, I see different meaning in this. Looking back at it through time. But now we get to the big, what's on it? What arms? Thankfully, no one mentioned arms. So, what are arms? Some weapons are, some weapons are. Arms have a very specific definition. Some weapons are arms, some, some weapons aren't. A knife is not an arm. A band, that's an arm. One another hand? A hunting rifle is not an arm. A Minuteman three ICBM is an arm. That carries up to three 100 kiloton, or 100 kiloton thermonuclear weapons. That's an arm. What is it? Military weapons. Arms are military weapons. So like brown vest muskets with a bayonet. A hunting rifle is not a military weapon, especially then, because it took too long to load. Oh, sure, some people might use it for that, but it just it took, it took two minutes to load a hunting rifle. So, military weapons. So, cannon with grape shot. Gunpowder, smoothbore muskets that you can arm quickly. Or today, tanks. M1 tanks or um, I don't like F-35. So we'll go with F-16 fighter planes. So with that. And so it's arms. That's what they talked about. And up until 2010, everybody understood that. That's what they're all about militia. So there's going to be restrictions on personal weapons. In 2010, the Supreme Court reversed about 50 different precedents. So it's one of the most Revolu one of the most revolutionary decisions in Supreme Court history overturned previous court decisions and said, we now believe that the founders implied in this personal language. And so that was in your lifetime. You were born in 2006, 2007, is that right? Who was born in 2006? 2007? 2005? Oh, so we're 2000. Oh, yeah, because 2000. Yeah, that's right. Remember those heady days of the Ox in 2000? It was crazy. It was just crazy. Let me tell you about the 1960s. Okay, moving on. But 2010, in your lifetime, it's called Heller versus DC. They just basically said, we've decided that the founders implied personal ownership. Nobody ever talked about mainstream. No politician talked about personal ownership of weapons and the Second Amendment to the 1970s. So that's really not that long ago. So the current argument about guns and people and wanting unlimited guns, that's a really new thing. It wasn't like that when I was your age. 
It just wasn't like that. So you're in a different world than I lived in. And that's where we get, it's just a totally different. How do we know the founders? Well, we know they're talking militia, but this one really shows it. There's Madison's first initial draft. If there's any argument what the Second Amendment was about this much, it was never about personal damage. You read that last clause? Have you ever heard, heard of a conscientious objector to, to the military? Because of some religious or um, deep feelings that you cannot fight in a war, you're a pacifist? Yeah. There are a lot of people like that. Maybe the most famous conscientious objector in American history would be the Bakr Muhammad Ali, who wouldn't be drafted. But yeah, there are people who be medics. And, and yeah, there's a conscientious objector. Well, that's what religiously screwed this was. And they took this last line out for one very important reason. No one religiously scrupulous of Baron should be compelled to render military service in person. This implied if you're not religiously scrupulous, you must join. And that's conscription or the draft. And they didn't want that because it implied that all young men must join unless you have a, a religious reason not to. So they got rid of that. That's why we're stuck with this weird convoluted thing. Now, personal ownership of weapons, we'll come to this in one second. There's an amendment called the Ninth Amendment and we'll get to it. That is a different thing. So that's the Second Amendment. So from what I told you, there's lots of gray areas. It's confusing. Let's go. I'm just going to, I'm just going to tell you a couple of things about all the rest very quickly. Oh, this, by the way, this amendment, it was not to protect slavery, <laughs> but they're thinking slavery. That's why I put a slave rebellion here. That's Haiti, 1791. So, Third Amendment. Oh, you need, that was no quartering of troops. Remember the Townshend Acts and the Boston Massacre, something direct happened. Remember the writs of assistance, which were blanket search warrants? That's why the Fourth Amendment says no unreasonable search and seizure. But do you see the loophole? Who defines unreasonable? Who carries out the laws? The executive branch. Do you see the loopholes? So the Fourth Amendment, but it's a gray area still. The Fifth Amendment goes through all the things where people are accused of a crime, but here's the biggie. You must, there be, must be due process of law. You must be tried. You must be, I'm sorry, you must have, if you're arrested, you must be told why you're arrested. You must be told of certain rights that you have. You must be a trial. That is called due process. But same deal. There's still a gray area. Who decides due process? The executive branch. Let's look at the Sixth Amendment. Speedy and public trial. What do you read the whole thing? Speedy and public trial. That's what we care about for this. I know there's more, but right here. Can anyone define speedy for me? We have a whole context of time. 100 years is pretty speedy, right? Is speedy one day or three years before a trial? And if anybody knows anything about the court system, you're, if you're up for trial, it's a long wait. So gray areas. We're not going to worry about seven. Let's jump right to eight. Eight, no excessive bail or no cruel and unusual punishment. Can you define excessive for me? Can anyone define cruel for me? What's cruel punishment? What's unusual punishment? Do you see the gray areas? What's cruel for you might not be cruel for me, or vice versa. I mean, look at the death penalty. Isn't death by definition cruel? But if you decide, no, that's not cruel, well, then what's an unusual way to kill somebody? You already decided to take the cruel step of killing somebody. Why, why just the only lethal objection? Why not impale them on a stick in the public square? I don't want to do that, but do you see the gray areas? My whole point in going through this is, 
They list rights, but they're restrictions on governments, but they're not full restrictions and they're not total rights. So let's get everyone. I do want you to write down the Ninth Amendment because the Ninth Amendment. Anybody want to explain this to me? Remember, I told you laws are written very complexly. Isn't that? <laughs> Or that, like, that takes away, denies, or disparages um, other laws or the rights that people already have to see the Constitution. You're, you're really close. But yeah. Yeah. You have rights that are outside the Constitution. Yeah. Essentially, yeah. You're exactly. The Constitution might list rights. You have rights beyond the Constitution. It doesn't say they can't, they might decide that's not a fight. But you have rights outside the Constitution. So Congress can't take away. Just the Congress can't blankly take away rights. You have rights outside of this. But see the problem with that? Define them. Oh, isn't that complex? Yeah, that's a really good point. Seventh Amendment is a, a civil trial. Oh, that, that's why I just I just saw I just saw common law just jumped out as being like past it. Yeah, I know I decided to skip that one, but that's about yeah. civil court cases or or a small claims. No, no, that's what the the uh, where small claims court would come from. I should add. So you have rights even if they're not in the Constitution. That's probably where personal ownership or weapons, without a doubt, might come. From. But Second Amendment, Tenth Amendment, another one you have to get. Same deal. It's written horribly, but states have all powers. Not given to the federal government. If the federal government doesn't have a power, the states have. So states are given all the powers. Now, that might sound like the state that therefore has a lot of power, right? And remember that federal system I talked about federal, state, and local government? This is federalism. But what is that clause of this Article One of the Constitution that says Congress has powers beyond what are listed? What was that clause? I told you the really important clause. Necessary and proper. So the necessary and proper bleeds into this, doesn't it? So that's the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights are amazing in some ways, but it's not as complete as you might think. It is more restrictions on what government can do. It is not for you to have more rights. And everybody add one more really important thing. They did not apply to the states until 1867. The states did not apply. There'll be a little amendment called the 14th Amendment that will kind of give us what we think of the government today. Boy, the 14th Amendment is good for us. That's coming. So the federal government, this only applies to federal. So states could actually make a state religion. And some still have state religion as late as the 1840s. Basically, it wasn't, you can't be Catholic. A few states have that. There's a lot of anti-Catholic lines. And well, you must be Protestant, it's better way to say. And yeah, this is a big deal. It only applied to federal government. And this would be confusing for people looking back at history. They get little tidbits of history and they find out things that happened before, before the end of the Civil War. And they say, oh, they can't do that. That violates the Bill of Rights. No, it didn't apply to states. It was all unclear, this gray area. We don't quite have the country, the good and bad elements of it we have the country today did not exist yet. That's the Bill of Rights. So, ready to move on to, Washington would be elected president. He is the only president who is gonna be unanimously elected to the, by the Electoral College. Madison kind of thought that the Electoral College would go away and all, all elections would be decided in the House of Representatives. That's what he thought would happen. No, that did not happen. But Washington would kind of create the presidency. Some people said he should be your excellency or your highness, but that sounded like a king to Washington. So he would call himself Mr. President. Yeah. It was something along the lines of like his presidency. 
something, something. Yeah, there was a talk about um, your excellency. Yeah. PT or name was can't remember the exact. It wasn't your excellency. It was something you said. Stop doing things. But he, it was kind of this really controversial, but you're not a king. And almost immediately, he used to be accused of being a king. One thing about Washington, too, he would not shake anybody's hands. He was very aloof, but he thought the president should have a distance or he would give you a little bit of time. The first president to shake hands, anybody want to guess who? Jefferson was like the man of the which is so weird to think about a president not shaking hands. You ever see a campaign stop, especially pre COVID, and they're just shaking hands with everybody? Shake babies. Oh, no. Shake hands. Shake hands, kiss babies. Yes, I've shaken. I've shaken. Let's see. I've Carter, Bush, Clinton, Obama. The president's not shaking his hands. So they don't, they remember. But not shaking his hand three times. So that went back and forth. Yeah. Two terms. He was done by the set, end of the second term. Completely done. And he wouldn't run again. Other people want to run for another term, but the precedent would be set. And one of the arguments in for years afterward, you want to run for a third term, but well, Washington only served too. That's what they said to FDR when he ran for his third term. The Constitution would be amended after World War II. The Judiciary Act, Congress would pass this, but Washington would then confirm the first federal judges under the court system we have today. So that, that's why I put Congress here. They passed the law, but Washington did it. And then, what about those judges? The Constitution says advise and consent. That turned into a confirmation process where the Senate would vote up or down on appointments. They didn't know, what's, what's advise and consent mean? They have no idea. They just put up. There's so many little things that have back to the Constitution. Eh, we'll figure it out later. In the state, there'll be four or well, five department offices. The two we really care about, State Department, he picked Thomas Jefferson. He was going to pick all of these men he saw as the brightest, the most elite. And then he picked Alexander Hamilton, the Secretary of the Treasury. Now, State Department today is foreign affairs. But then it was actually internal me measures and foreign affairs. So that's done now by the Justice Department. It's weird. The Secretary of State, uh, Kenneth Anthony Blinken now, but it's uh, it's foreign affairs. No one else has it. You have a foreign minister. Everybody else has a foreign minister. And then he also gave a farewell address. And this farewell address, then every president, when they leave office, would feel it necessary to give one. Most farewell addresses are pretty boring and drab, but Washington made a couple warnings. We could argue whether or not we agree with the warnings, but they're going to have, it's gonna be very prescient. So let's get to a couple things really quickly, because Alexander Hamilton had a grand vision for the future of the United States, and this shocked the brand new Speaker of the House, elected the brand new House of Representatives, guy named James Madison, who they were allies for the Constitution. What we would call today Hamiltonian economics, and I got to be clear about Hamiltonian economics. The term economics wouldn't have made sense. This is its vision on how the United States will deal with manufacturing, with production, with supply, with the money for paying for it. He would write a couple different pamphlets, essentially. One called the Report on Credit, the other one called the Report on Manufacturers. Now, this is the Industrial Revolution had literally just begun in Britain. Capitalism, therefore, was literally just being created, but not in the United States. Hamilton, who fought and was wounded against the British, also really admired them and won and thought the future of the United States was not going to be farms. It's going to be manufacturing, finance, and the military. And so what was it? Government policy must be to help the financial elite. You notice I did not see the agricultural elite like the big plantations. And so he wanted more money into the hands of the wealthy. So basically, the rich aren't rich enough. If the wealthy have more money, they're smarter and better than average people. They're of a better sort, he would say many times. The very same people who wrote the Constitution to benefit themselves, even though they're going to branch off in different ideas. 
The financial elite, the urban financial elite will take that money and build factories, or as he said, manufacturing. Factories, the concept of a factory, production under one roof, brand new. You would build. And finance, his concept, a banking system. He looked at Britain and the Netherlands and saw that their early developments in what we call capitalism today was because of the availability of credit. And so that's what he'll do. Therefore, put money into the hands of the wealthy, build manufacturing, and then build a strong military to protect against rebellion like Shade's rebellion, but also to protect trade. There was no standing army. Washington created a war department under Henry Knox. But there's no army. There's only militia. There's no U.S. Army, only militia. There's no Navy. He wants this. He wants a military state, but partially to protect them from rebellion. Need to, need to punch something? Need holes? <laughs> and then, all the better farmers, we want to turn them into low-wage workers. Low wages working for the, the new manufacturer. And so for the vast majority of people, he saw them as wage earners. Or as Jefferson would have said, slaves. Wage earners. Not independent farmers, wage earners. So he saw a world of just a few manufacturers. Monopolies. Now, this was his idea. But money in the hands of the wealthy. In the next century, this would be called laissez-faire economics. But at the end of the 19th century, not all of Hamilton's ideas, you know, like because this is still pre-capitalism. But this will become known as end of the 19th century. So we're talking 1880s, 1890s. This kind of economics will be called conservative economics. And this is conservative economics. And the idea is you give money to the wealthy. They will invest it properly. They will not waste it at all because they're the most rational people in society. They'll make factories and production, and therefore the wealth will trickle down. That's actually a term from the 1920s, trickle down to everybody else. Of course, you might say a contradiction here because they want to keep most workers' wages low, but still trickle down. And so government policy should be to funnel money from the bottom to the top, and that will bring prosperity. Uh, trickle down would be conservative later on by the 1970s it's called supply side. And that is still the basis of conservative economics today. Obviously different because it's not 1791. And so in your lifetime, economically, we've been conservative. We, we have not had someone who was not a conservative economic president since 1969. Democrats are generally less conservative, but every Democratic president since 1969 has been conservative. Carter was conservative. Clinton was very conservative. Obama was conservative. And President Trump was maybe the most conservative president. His policies, massive tax cuts for the very wealthy, the corporations, and um, yeah, efforts to push and drive wages down. That's what they have. And so that's what money is. Biden is used to be pretty conservative, and now he is probably less conservative. What's Montana? It's the governor, it's governor economically conservative. Exceedingly conservative. The last legislature just passed massive tax cuts um, for the very wealthy and actually tax increases for most people. My taxes are going to go up next year. Probably most of your parents' taxes. You're afraid they're going to go off. Probably. So, why? But money they have. Jean, Governor Jean Fort is. He's trying to get out of state people to come and buy land and start building. That's what his goal is. That's his policy. To more out of staters. So, with that, but that's Hamiltonian economics. So, with that, let's get to one. I'll do this to start real quick. The assumption. 
They said to them, I know you wrote that in your notes. And by the way, I won't collect this. Everyone's going to take this out. I'm going to give you credit for doing this. I know the, the book said it. And I, I, I wait. How much do I want to tell you about it? This is such a big deal. The assumption bill. So everyone go take this out and I will give you some credit for it. Turn them in. Pay up all the debt. All the colonial debt, all the bonds, all. I just grabbed yours. <laughs> you didn't finish it, get it finished and get it to me. I don't want half. I got everybody? Okay, so we're getting this out. Last thing to get down. No phone yet. So they're going to pay off 100% of the value. But remember, speculators were buying up these bonds at a penny on the dollar. And so only a few speculators have that. And you still have that. Get it tomorrow. You're going to be gone tomorrow? Thursday. 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 And they're going to make, if you paid a penny on a dollar and got 100% value of a back, that's a 1,000% profit. What a massive boon to those speculators. So who's going to get money to? The merchant class. Finish this on Thursday. I don't think we got this, but I got to go. This is such, Hamilton is, is kind of crazy. How brilliant he was. And diabolical. Hamilton was there. Wow. Madison, you can see why Madison and Jefferson hated Hamilton. Everybody hated Hamilton. And it's so weird there's such a popular play about Hamilton and everybody despises him. Yeah? No. The play is so popular, the, the musical is so popular now about a, a man that everyone hated. Who they thought I changed? <laughs> you know, I very well could have thought I did. <laughs> so, I, will, I will do it. I'll do it right now. Thank you. Thank you for knowing to be like, I kind of must have. Yes, I'm trying to. Cool. Oh, hey. Charles of Coronation is set to take place on May 7th. I'm going to put this in. 